Shortly after midday on the 17th of December 1944, at an unknown crossroads in the Belgian Ardennes, gunfire erupted. In a matter of moments, SS troops from Hitler's own bodyguard cold-bloodedly murdered 84 American prisoners. In this video, we we'll use the latest technology and original archive footage from the battlefield to tell the story of what became known as the Malmedy Massacre. By autumn 1944, the German army was suffering setbacks across the board. Driven from Normandy with severe losses, they had by December retreated as far as the borders of the Third Reich. Installing themselves behind the once formidable Siegfried Line, they awaited the winter. Almost all observers at that time expected the Axis forces to use this time to rest and replenish, but, unknown to most, Hitler had other plans. Having searched for opportunities in the latter part of the year, he was determined to launch one last massive offensive in the West, designed to isolate and destroy the Western Allies and bring about peace on the Western Front, before turning all his remaining might eastwards to halt the advancing Soviets. That opportunity, as slim as it was, came right here in the Ardennes. Mustering his most powerful formations and backed with a scattering of new super heavy King Tiger tanks, he would launch three panzer armies into the Allied lines through the lightly defended Ardennes region, splitting US forces from their British and Canadian allies, driving deep into the rear areas and capturing the vital supply hub of Antwerp. Leading the northernmost of these three attacking armies would be the men of his own personal bodyguard, the 1st SS Panzer Division Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler. The man at the head of that vanguard was the notorious SS Obersturmbannführer Jochen Piper. A 29-year-old die-hard Nazi, Piper had joined the SS back in 1938 and had served for a time as Himmler's personal adjutant before taking to the battlefield, where he had earned a reputation as an efficient and utterly ruthless soldier. Commanding the infamous Blowtorch Battalion, Piper himself was proud of the brutal reputation his men had earned, once writing, Our reputation precedes us as a wave of terror and is one of our best weapons. Even old Genghis Khan would gladly have hired us as helpers. Piper's objective was relatively simple. Exploit a gap opened in the front line by the 12th Volksgrenadier Division around Losheimer Graben, with his Kampfgruppe of some 4,800 men, 117 tanks and 800 other vehicles, and race westwards in an attempt to secure the vital crossing of the Meuse River before the numerically superior allies had time to react and block his advance. Speed was everything. Although not part of his original plan, the changing situation on the ground would ultimately lead him to the little-known crossroads at a place called Bonnier. Let's take a look. Bonnier rests at an important crossroads known as Five Points to the Americans, linking Malmedy to the village of Ligneville and eventually on to Saint-Vite around nine miles to the south. To the east of the crossroads lay a north-south parallel road some 700 yards away, leading to the village of Tirimont. It was from this direction that any advancing enemy column must approach. By blending this remarkable aerial image, taken at the time, onto the modern map, we can see that the area is very different today to how it was in 1944. Back then, it was a modest area with only a few scattered houses around the crossroads, several copses of woodland and numerous open fields and enclosed pastures which in December 1944 were, as usual in the winter, under several inches of snow. Today, of course, a number of businesses and even a museum to the massacre have sprung up in the area, but the road layout and the site's importance as a local logistics hub remain the same. We shouldn't forget that in December 1944, Bornier lay 13 miles behind the front line. Besides military hospital units in Malmedy, an anti-aircraft headquarters in Ligneville and scattered engineer companies across nearby towns and villages, the area remained relatively unoccupied. In fact, all that stood in the way of German forces in this part of the line that December were a thinly held mixture of completely green or battle-hardened but exhausted American units brought into this quiet area for rest and rebuilding. It was they who would be called on to stop Germany's largest offensive of the war in the West. Early in the morning of the 16th of December, under a terrific bombardment all across an 80 mile front and with combat camera team in tow, 
assault began, with leading elements of the SS caught on film as they advanced through the Ardennes. Progress was slow and frustrating due to strong US resistance, but by the following day, Piper's column had reached here. It was at this point that the column suffered a further setback. Arriving at this road beyond Tirimont, it was realized that the route forward was impassable to anything larger than a half track, and so with no other option, he sent the bulk of his column on a wide northwards diversion directly towards Malmedy and the nearby crossroads at Bournier. Now let's shift our focus to the American perspective. As we've established, the region surrounding Malmedy was deep within the American rear, and as a result, there were few frontline troops in the area, and on the morning of the 17th of December, medical units in Malmedy were actively evacuating the area due to growing realization of the German breakthrough. Lieutenant Colonel Pergrin from the 291st Engineer Combat Battalion recalled the unfolding situation in the town. First thing in the morning, Captain John Condon called in from the Company B command post in Malmady. He insisted upon speaking directly with me. Colonel, Lieutenant Ray has sighted a German armored column heading our way, running free and clear. Shall we prepare to defend? German armor? In our rear? I told John that Company B should definitely prepare to defend and that I would be along as quickly as possible to check the situation. About the same time, the US 7th Armoured Division were on the move, heading south towards Saint-Vit to defend the town. The division had two routes to reach Saint-Vit, a western one through Stavelot, Trois-Ponts and Villesalm, and a faster eastern one through Malmedy and Ligniville. Amongst those arriving in the area were the men of Battery B of the 285th Field Artillery Observer Battalion, led by Captain Roger Mills. These men, in around 30 trucks and jeeps, armed only with small arms, were specialists in sound ranging and flash spotting, tasked with identifying German artillery positions, not frontline combat troops. At approximately 12.15, Battery B's column halted here in Malmedy, deliberating on which route to take. Pergrin, offering guidance, suggested Mills divert to the safer western route, as reconnaissance report indicated the imminent arrival of German forces. Despite this advice, Mills remained convinced that the faster eastern route could still lead them safely to Saint-Vite, and his column set out shortly after 12.30. Meanwhile, military policeman PFC Homer Ford had been directing traffic of the 7th Armoured and the Bournier crossroads throughout the morning. Around 12.45, several minutes after a tank unit of his division had passed by, leading vehicles of Battery B appeared, moving towards him along this road. As with other units, Ford gestured for them to continue in the direction of Saint-Vit. While the column passed him by, Ford's attention was drawn eastwards towards the rumble of tanks in the distance, prompting him to wonder which American unit might have deviated from the route. He soon realized the truth, as the leading elements of Kampfgroup Piper came into view and opened fire. Let's take a moment to understand the situation. So by 12.45, we have the men of Battery B heading southwards in column along this road towards Saint-Vite, whilst at the same time heading northwards on their diverted route parallel to that column were the leading tanks of Kampfgruppe Piper. It's likely that as the head of Piper's column reached this junction and began its left turn towards Bournier, it spotted the Americans around the crossroads. Obersternfuhrer Sternebeck recalled the moment. I saw an enemy truck column negotiating the intersection, moving south. The lead panzer opened fire. Several vehicles immediately caught fire. The column became confused and the vehicles began running off the road and into each other. That was the moment to attack. Before reaching the intersection, we were hit by machine gun fire and rifle fire from the dismounted crews. When my lead panzer had approached to within 60 to 70 meters, the Americans stood up from the roadside ditch and raised their hands to surrender. The action lasted only moments, as surprised, enormously outgunned and outnumbered, the straggling column of American unarmoured vehicles which had just passed the crossroads was hit from the flank by withering fire and immediately overrun. Shocked and with no chance of resistance, the bulk of the survivors had little choice but to lay down their arms and surrender, with only a handful managing to flee into the countryside before the SS arrived. 
Timings are unclear, but it's believed that shortly afterwards, Piper himself, in his haste to reach Lignyville, passed the site and at that time delegated the handling of the prisoners to SS Sturmbannfuhrer Putschka. The exact conversation the two men had about the prisoners is today shrouded in mystery, as are the subsequent events. But at Putschka's order, the nearby German forces quickly corralled the Americans into this field adjacent to the crossroads. By 2 p.m., a total of 113 American prisoners had been assembled at this location. Sergeant Ken Ahrens was there and recalled the scene. When they got us back to the crossroads, they searched us and went through our pockets, taking watches, rings, and wallets, whatever we had on us. They pushed us into this field, which was more or less an enclosed cow pasture. By the time I got there, practically my entire company was lined up and everything was in quite a turmoil. A lot of our boys had been hurt, and a few of our aid men were running around trying to help. We stood for about half an hour, I would say. At the same time, they had lined up probably two or three tanks on the edge of the field, with probably five or six in each. One tank had finally straightened around, one of their men stood on the top of it, aimed down into the front of our group, and fired once. That single shot was immediately answered by a hail of bullets from the SS around the field, which ripped into the group of defenseless men. Bodies crumpled and fell to the snow-covered ground as screams of shock and agony pierced the air. In the chaos, those further from the German guns tried to flee, only to be pursued and cut down by German gunfire. In just a few moments, not a single man was left standing, and the air was once again filled with noise, this time the low murmur of badly wounded men struggling to cling to life. B Battery's Mario Butera was there, feigning death in the snow. I was conscious as I lay there, and could hear the German voices and laughing. Then I heard pistol shots. And one of my companions who was lying beside me moaning and spitting blood was approached by a German who fired four shots from a pistol into his body. By taking a look at this harrowing post-war survey, we see exactly where each man was when the gunfire started, their bodies remaining unmoved from this moment. This is an important document, as the compact nature of the main group shows, contrary to some SS accounts of the time, that most of the Americans were stationary when the shooting started, not trying to escape, as some of the defendants later claimed. Of what followed next, there's no doubt. For those men still living, the only hope for survival lay in silence. Remaining motionless as the perpetrators walked amongst the dead and wounded, shooting or clubbing anyone who showed signs of life. It was a horrific ordeal. Lying in the snow, many bleeding heavily, they remained still, until eventually, the massacre seemingly complete, the Germans mounted their vehicles and moved off to rejoin their convoy westwards, leaving in their wake 84 murdered men. Within hours of the Bonnier massacre, news of the atrocity had reached the American lines. Some survivors had made it to Malmedy, prompting a swift response from Eisenhower's headquarters, which decided to immediately publicize the event in the press and initiate a formal investigation, the event taking the more newsworthy but inaccurate name of the Malmedy massacre. In the days and weeks that followed, in part bolstered by the news of the horrific treatment of their comrades, American resolve hardened and the advance of Kampfgruppe Piper and all of the major German efforts to reach the Meurs were held and eventually driven back towards the Siegfried Line, leaving behind thousands of dead and hundreds of invaluable tanks, this time with American combat camera teams capturing the action. In the wake of that renewed Allied advance came more men, this time with the grim task of locating and investigating the many war crimes committed all across the front. On January 13th, 1945, still under a blanket of snow, Lieutenant Colonel Welch of the Army Inspector General Office, overseeing the initial investigation, arrived in the area of Bournier, on the heels of the 120th Infantry Regiment, and found that same field still full with the frozen and mutilated bodies of the men of Battery B. The following day, accompanied by a combat photographer, medical officer and a graves registration unit, they began the awful task of recovering the fallen. 
Each body was searched, photographed, examined and meticulously tagged with numbered signs before being recovered and taken to a military hospital for a full autopsy to be carried out. Those autopsies revealed a chilling narrative. Almost all the victims displayed multiple gunshot wounds to the body, but this was noted as the cause of death of only 20 cases, those highlighted here with orange circles. Shockingly, in 43 instances, those highlighted here in red, the victims had died from close-range shots to the head, predominantly at the base of the skull or behind the ear. While three cases were established as death due to blows to the head, likely with a rifle butt. The remaining victims, those in blue or black, were classified as either unknown or various miscellaneous cases subsequent to the shooting. One thing we shouldn't forget when looking at this map is that behind each of these numbers lies a name, a face, a life, each of which ended that day in December 1944. When finally the guns fell silent across Europe in May 1945, the search for the perpetrators could begin. The targets? SS General Sepp Dietrich, seen here as a prisoner in American custody, SS Standartenführer Jochen Piper, and 72 surviving men of his Kampfgruppe and other units were tracked down in POW camps across Europe and eventually brought to trial in the former Dachau concentration camp in May 1946, charged with the killing of more than 300 US POWs and 100 civilians, including the Malmedy 84. In a trial that was full of controversy, including allegations of torture of the defendants, many claimed to have not been present, or if they were, that they'd simply been following orders. Dozens of witnesses appeared for the prosecution, including seven men who'd survived the massacre, each telling a harrowing tale of cold-blooded murder against unarmed men. On 16th of July, verdicts were finally reached, with 43 men, including Piper, generally held as the man responsible for the massacre, being sentenced to death by hanging, and a further 23 receiving a sentence of life in prison. Despite those convictions, not a single man was sent to the gallows. In what became a hugely politicised trial and subsequent commission into the treatment and interrogation of prisoners, and in a general spirit of post-war desire for reconciliation, all sentences were commuted, and by 1956, every single man had been freed. Many of those perpetrators returned to civilian life, took up jobs and had successful careers in post-war Germany, their crimes forgotten. Even Joachim Piper had seemingly escaped justice, taking up a management role with Porsche, until eventually, under pressure from factory workers over other massacres he was implicated in, he was dismissed from his position. Remaining a lifelong Nazi and part of an underground SS veterans network, he eventually relocated to the small village of Trave in southeastern France and began working as a translator of military texts under the pseudonym of Reina Buchmann. Recognised in the street by a member of the French resistance one day in 1974, Piper was publicly outed in the French press and his past crimes publicised. Over the following months, he received death threats from anti-Nazi groups and graffiti appeared on the road leading to his isolated home, the location of which can still be identified to this day. In retaliation, Piper gave several bitter interviews from his home in which he claimed he had already paid for his crimes, which further angered the local population. On the evening of the 14th of July 1976, Bastille Day, against the backdrop of fireworks and explosions, gunshots were heard, and a fire soon reported on the outskirts of Trave. When eventually the flames were extinguished on this now overgrown and abandoned home, Piper was nowhere to be seen. Some time later, in the burnt-out shell of this house, a shrunken and unidentifiable charred body was discovered, holding a pistol and a 22 calibre rifle. Perhaps more than 30 years after the end of the Second World War, Jochen Piper became the only man convicted for the massacre to truly pay for his crimes. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy what we do, then why not check out our Patreon community and other videos right here on YouTube. And for those with an interest in the First World War, be sure to check out our brand new podcast, Not So Quiet on the Western Front, where each week we explore a famous episode from the old front lines. That's all this time. 
See you again soon.